Okay, we're good to go. Okay, is everyone uh, okay? Okay, so, hello everybody. Uh, we are, this, uh, this is machine learning from square one. So this, this is the first workshop I think we've done for uh, all of us. Uh, and um, so this is a little bit of a pilot. So if you guys have any suggestions, do tell. Uh, also, if like, the links aren't working, um, so there is like just uh, shout yeah, or just raise shout. your hand. We can all hear each other. Um, so uh, we're going to be working with Google Colab. Uh, if any of you have worked with that course, basically an online Python environment uh, with the GPU available. Nice people at Google basically supply that for free. Uh, so if you all go to this link, you'll see the disc uh, go to the Discord, uh, and the Discord has the link to the Colab, uh, and you should then be able to. Uh, open it in the playground uh, and everything. That'll come, that'll come later. We're going to go through a little bit. Uh, we're going to go through the collab itself, which is right here. This is what you should see. I think it's worth giving a shot from before, right? And then we're going to uh, okay. then the essentially we're going to do more or less around an hour, hour and a half of just doing some stuff on the whiteboard. Then the, the last hour is going to be uh, every, everyone just gets a chance to like work with the collab themselves and maybe tweak it. So everything the collab should work out of the box, just executing one cell after the other. Uh, and the whole idea is that you guys can print everything, um, you guys can like switch, uh, add, change, add a new data set, do anything you want. Uh, and then we'll try and like accommodate you guys and, and, and help where it works either. Uh, so if we just start off, um, the idea of uh, machine learning from square one is to try and understand Every uh, is trying to understand machine learning from the basics, and then quickly move up uh, to actually building our stuff, uh, building models and everything uh, for our own ideas. Maybe because uh, I'm sure everyone's seen the uh, the standard. Uh, here's build, build a state of the art model in three lines. It's pretty. It's pretty like that's really that's really cool, but it's pretty difficult to like modify those three lines to do something that you actually might want to do from, from scratch. Uh, so we're going to basically start by, uh, with a little bit of the math, going over some derivatives uh, and partial derivatives, and then go uh, to implementing uh, what, what we describe in the code itself. So if we think of what uh, machine learning algorithm does, if we think of how we want to solve something using machine learning, we need to essentially describe it in such a way that we need to min min minimize some value, and we need to we get to decide everything. So one of the, uh, one of the standard and classical examples is um, say image classification. Now, if we see image classification as something like this, so image classification is simply the task of taking an image and then classifying it according to a set number of categories that we give it to. And then we simply say, okay, out of all these 10 categories, so like, for example, this represents, or 0, 1, 2, 9, like this, we essentially want to describe like probability distribution. Say, for example, it's probability 0 that this image right here is a zero. It's probability zero and stuff. And then we come over here to number seven and we say like probability this is like 0.99. Like that's this is into what classification is. And the idea here is we need to really understand what is it that our input data looks like and what is that that our output format looks like. So for this problem for instance, we can see we got essentially a grid, a pixel a pixel a pixel grid where we have each, each pixel itself is represented by a series of numbers. And then the output, the output format is simply an array of 10 numbers. And we essentially want to try and figure out how to transform this array of numbers into this array of numbers. And we basically need to figure out what is it that, well, what are the numbers uh, that actually transform something like this into something like this. And that's all machine learning is doing. And so we have a series of tools uh, that essentially allow us to do that. So for example, if we take the example that we're actually going to deal with today, it's 
something like linear regression. So this, this is a simpler machine learning problem as opposed to the previous one, where the previous one was classification of an image. It's a very, quite, quite a complex data structure, like what, what an image is. It's got a lot of, a lot of moving parts. This is simply a number, like one single number. So if we, if we input, say, number 20, we expect to get number 50 out. This is simply a function. Uh, pretty, pretty simple. We essentially want to try and figure out how can we transform number 20 into a 50, and 60 into a 100. And so the way we would do that, like in our heads, is sort of like, OK, if I put a number, say, 120 over here, and I tell you, what's the number that's going to come out at the top? I might say 130, more or less, 140. I mean, no, 300, 330, 340, some, some number at the top over there. Intuitively, what's, what's happening is sort of you're fitting a line like to this state. You're sort of thinking, OK, I can assume that the data has some sort of form. It's probably going to look like a line. And I kind of know the direction of that line. Uh, but you sort of do this in your head. You're sort of thinking, you, you, don't, you don't actually know for sure like maybe why that is. You're sort of assuming that the data is going to follow this path. Say, for instance, your data looks something like this. Then this would be a different curve. Uh, this, for example, a line here, any kind of line that you describe is probably not going to describe this part very well. So we kind of need to make some assumptions on the way our data is at the moment. So we're sort of assuming the model is a line, and we essentially need to figure out what are the numbers that, uh, that work for this line. So what we can do is say, OK, let's start with some random numbers that describe our line. So if our, if our data is this, which is what it is, um, say we start. sort of intuitively tell that this doesn't represent the data pretty well. This, it's sort of just, it's just not right. But the trick with machine learning is you essentially want to find a way to describe, like, what is it about this line that can give us a number that says how bad this prediction is. Because we're sort of assuming that our data looks a certain way. We've got a line that's of the form ax plus b. And we essentially want to say, like, how good is this line representing our data? Uh, and the same thing happens for the classification uh, model with the images. We just basically need to find like, a way to say, how good is the current prediction that we've, that we've made? So for example, how does, I'm going to ask one of you guys, um, how would you guys uh, say this line isn't good? Does anyone, anyone want to say? How could, how could you describe that this line like just doesn't fit this data very well? So you can sort of tell. So maybe like is there a mathematical way that you can explain this? Sorry? Mean squared error. So mean squared error mean squared error. Or just if we did something like this. I mean, because for example, f of x equals x is, some, is just a straight line like this. And the objective is to get to somewhere around 0. Here, the objective of, in order to minimize this, like, how, how bad is the model number, we essentially, all we need to do is just find a minimum value for, for, this, it, it, for, for this whole function right here. And we, all do, we do that because we square it because essentially the lower this thing is right here, the better, the better, our, uh, the better our guess for A and B are going to be because then the distance is way smaller 
And then when we square something small, we also we get back something small. We square something large, we get larger. And so essentially our objective is to find the minimum point of this particular function. We sort of reframe <coughs> the, the, the problem, just adding a little, like this, uh, just squaring the loss function here. Okay, so does everyone uh, follow so far? Um, the idea is uh, if at any point you're lost, do ask a question. Uh, this, uh, like, the whole point of the of the workshop is to essentially go through a lot of this together. So, if there's if you're sort of wondering like why are you only doing for one one number at a time or something, or I don't know any kind of question. What's what, what does this input look like? What is x? Uh, just do ask. <coughs> um, so. So let's go with our initial estimates of minus three and negative two. So say for instance, so A equals negative three and B equals negative two. This we're sort of like bam, initialized our model from scratch. Um, and we don't know if these values are any good or not, so let's go through one single forward pass of what it looks like to go through this model. So our model to calculate this loss value is this function right here. So say we look at our graph, we'll pick a point, say this one, so 20 and 50. somewhere around here. Is it squared? 112. Right here. <coughs> so we gotta figure squared. out like sorry. That has to be squared. Sorry. Oh squared, yeah. yeah. So then you just have to like this part yeah. we need to square. Yeah. So we're pretty bad. Minus three and negative two suck. This is a bad estimate. Um, we need to figure out a way to make these numbers better. Um, and preferably without randomly sampling, because we could choose like negative two if we wanted to, but there's no real reason why we would do that other than guessing and because we kind of know something about the data. So how do we compute analytically where, like, I, how do we compute which direction to take both A and B? And this this is the this is what actually machine <coughs> learning is about for like these these newer architectures that you see all the time. They essentially take all this data 
which is what we have, give a random, random estimates for the initial parameters, and then just find a way to fit all that data. So essentially, if we want to, we want to go from somewhere around here, which is where we are with this huge number, down to somewhere near zero, we can, we can turn this to the gradient. Something that tells us, like, something that tells us, like, the direction of the minimum is, like, this way for e, for both a and b something something that tells us like okay why a like in order to minimize this function you need to take a and b in a certain direction and the way we can do that is basically saying okay we have a function that we want to minimize all we need to do is basically take the derivative of this function with respect to each particular weight so a and b and then say, okay, which, so for, for, for example, for weight A, if we wanted to minimize the weight, if, it, if we wanted to min minimize the loss for a particular weight A, which direction do we take? Do we, like, if we say instead of negative three, we do negative 3.5 or negative 2.5, which direction do we go? So we can use a partial derivative. So for instance, if we have our loss here. So we say the loss is equal to f of x plus minus b squared. Then Or partial f for partial a, yeah. So, the, it, this is essentially what we're trying to figure out. is like, how does this function change with respect to a? How do we, how can we change this? If we, we change a to make it smaller, what happens to the cost? Do we make it smaller? So, we essentially just need to figure, we need to derive, we, do, we need to do the derivative for this with respect to a. So, we all know our derivatives. It's essentially two. Does anyone want to say it? I, I already know it, but does anyone want to say it? Y minus AX plus B?
So now we essentially have like the function that tells us, okay, what's the what's the direction, what's the gradient with respect to A for this particular loss? We're up here, how how does that how does A change that? So if we plug in our numbers right here for which we're which we already have, say actually these numbers are huge. Let's let's change this. Let's change this. negative two right here with direction with direction of a gradient of negative one so it's something like this right this is what our function looks like it's not a very good function that this approximation isn't very good because essentially our function if we if we give x right here it's going to tell us it's some negative number when in reality it's what we're looking for is one so we essentially want to find a way to tell this line to go up in some way. So we already know how to change A. So the gradient right here, A, which is negative one, we just need to plug in our numbers here. So the gradient is going to be two X, which is one. So two times one times A, which is negative one, A times X, which is one, plus b, which is negative 2, minus y, which is 1. Can everyone see that, more or less? It's pretty small. Okay. So we take this. This is 2. This is negative 1. Okay, plus negative 2 is 3. Negative 4. And then times 2, which is negative 8. Negative so we have this, this number right here. What does this mean? Okay. What is, so we have negative A. How does, we have our loss function. And we're saying, if you, if like, the direction that, or the gradient that A has with respect to what this function represents is negative 8. It means that essentially, if you increase a, the loss is going to be yes. So if we follow the great A, if we if we follow the great A, the gradient, essentially negative A, it's gonna it. See, I need your help. So I'm trying to. If you, how, how do you describe? Essentially, we have the gradient mm -hmm. of A. Mm -hmm. a um, this is to A, if we sort of see this as a, a single simple quadratic function, this mm -hmm. value right here, the gradient is positive. Yeah. yeah. So what it's telling us here is that A is some number So it's because the gradient's negative. Yeah, so it's for that value of A, the tangent at that point to yeah. the curve would have slope minus A. Yes, yeah. so A looks something like, A is some point over here, and we essentially want to take A somewhere closer to here, and somewhere closer to where it's zero. And we can tell that we want to take it in a positive, in a positive direction, because mm -hmm. If we go in a direction where A increases, the gradient is telling us that the, the loss is going to decrease because, because of this negative sign. Essentially, if we're saying 
we're like, we, 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 we're like on a, a plane right here, and we're sort of thinking, okay, if I take a step in increasing x, or increasing a, or decreasing a, what is that effect going to have? And if, what this is saying is, if we increase a, we're going to go down by negative a. Say, if we incre increase x, or a by 1, we're going to go down by negative so essentially we want to we want to follow we want to uh, we want to follow we want to try and increase a to, to, to actually benefit from this for, for, to benefit from the fact that we're going down the slope as this gradient is telling us. So what we do is we can simply say a is equal to whatever a was before plus a, I mean minus the gradient. So essentially if we are going if we want to go in this direction because we're trying to minimize this function and the gradient is telling us this is negative a, essentially we want to do like a, which is right here, a is equal to a minus, minus negative a. This, what this is telling us is essentially go in the direction of the, the, where the gradient is telling you essentially a not to go. If, you, if, we're, if the gradient says if you go backwards, you're going to increase, it, it, the value is going to increase because that's what's going to happen. What, what we're looking for is to have a be somewhere around here where whatever value it has, the loss is going to be zero. Then we essentially want to go in the direction that the gradient doesn't want us to go. So you do the negative. So essentially now we can we know how to update a. We know which direction to take because we can do a minus minus a. And the problem with this is essentially this is a really big step to take. If we're if we're going here, let's say a well a is negative one. If we do plus uh, if we do plus eight, a is going to be seven. And that's that's pretty bad. Like, if our function is this, like this is our function already. Uh, gradient of seven is going to be something like this, right? Because a is essentially being increased. We this is like too big of a step. We want to essentially make this step a lot more granular. We want so essentially we can multiply whatever this is by some constant that says don't take. Take, take the gradient, take the information that the gradient is telling you of going in a certain direction, which in our case is increasing, is increasing A, but just multiply it by a smaller number, which we're going to, so this right here, this is uh, how it's usually seen in the machine learning literature as alpha as the learning rate. So if we set the learning rate of oh, alpha, Then essentially whatever whatever step the gradient's telling us to do, we're just gonna take a smaller step. So since if we're right here, we're saying, okay, what does the gradient look like? We calculate the gradient for A. The gradient's telling us to make it to increase A if we want to make the loss smaller. So instead of taking a really big step, confident step in that direction, we're just taking a small step. And then what this has is we're basically Going from here to here, like this. Because if we increase a way too much, then we could go over here or here or something, and it's just getting worse. So it's better to go just little by little. So with this learning rate right here, we just take small, small steps in the direction that the gradient's taking us, and then hopefully we'll arrive at a place where. A is actually a pretty good approximation to a, uh, to what the actual value that describes the data is. So essentially, if we apply this, apply our formula essentially now, so A, which was originally 1, A is now equal to 1 minus minus 1, yeah, so we're going to do plus 8, multiplied by 0 0.01. Oh, 
all of two, but minus one. So which is zero? Who said it? Yeah. Zero point nine two. So yeah. So we have a new value for a. And what does that look like for our model now? So essentially, instead of it being negative one, our, gra our line, instead of looking like this, now looks like this, which kind of makes sense. Like the gradient is just a little bit smaller than one. So you can see like this data point has influenced our model in such a way that it's gonna get closer to it. And the reason we've done that is because we know which direction change the gradient in order to get closer to this particular value. Because as we described, like the way we're defining our loss is through the distance between this value and this value. So if the distance is large, the loss is large. If the distance is small, we're doing a pretty good job. And so the gradient is essentially telling us information. In order to make this distance smaller, you need to change A in such a way that it increases. And so we have. <coughs> so if we were to do the same thing for B, right, we'll just, this will be our last example. I'll do it over here. <coughs> so we're gonna, we need to now figure out how do we change B, because we've done the calculation for A, but A, A, but A is not the only variable in, in this model. So D, Now that we've done all this, does anyone want to save one for B? <laughs> so this is this is the function that we're actually doing the truth of. Just without the minus x. Yeah. Do you want to explain why? So essentially, we're doing the same thing as before, where we have the square here, so we do two, and then take y minus x plus b, and then we just take the derivative of this inner part with respect to b. And why doesn't depend if b? Why the, this this operation right here doesn't depend on b? This doesn't depend on b. This part does, and the derivative of b is 1. So we just do negative 1. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, is that the derivative of f with respect to b? Yeah. Oh, shoot. Yeah. So this is our derivative. This is how we need to change b to, or actually, no, this is not how we need to change it. This is simply going to tell us some information on how do we change b in such a way that the model gets better. So we can do our calculation. First one, the new wins. Uh, so two y is one. Yeah, one. So one minus a, which is not that. We're using sort of the previous value of a, which is negative one. Because we've already updated a here. So negative one times x, which is one. Yeah, it's one minus negative three is four, multiplied by two is eight, then multiplied by minus one. So it's minus negative, eight. negative eight again. Okay, so yeah, that now looked. we have 
now we have our gradient information. We have, we have essentially scoped the area and said, okay, for B, which direction should I take to go? Should I step forwards or backwards? And A is telling us if you increase, A, if you increase B, uh, the value for the loss is going to go down because it's negative. It's essentially it's like a slope that's going this way. So we want to follow that. So B equals B minus The red rate. So now we can update this, okay. and this is going to be negative one and point nine two. Make sense, right? So now our <coughs> second update, our update for our next variable is now changing this line to. Line because we've sort of increased this by a little bit. Right? We've sort of pushed this number up because B is no longer negative 2. It's, this actually is like <laughs> way different. But uh, you sort of see visually that we're sort of getting closer to this value. And the interesting thing is that if you then apply this, this algorithm like multiple times, you essentially say, okay, now the updated value of B, which was before negative 2, is now negative 9, 2 then you're able to say, okay, let's just keep updating A and B so that it gets closer to this number. And the cool thing is that you can essentially do it for a whole bunch of other numbers. So you do it for this one, and this one, and this one. The same process that we've been going through, you can go through every single number in your data set, and then the line is essentially going to sort of move around with all this gradient information saying like, oh, in order to approximate this point, you need to move the line a little bit further up or a little bit further down. And this is, a, and essentially this is what our, our, our machine learning is doing for us. It's basically taking some random values that we, were, that we originally said like, this, this is our initial state of the model. And then we're passing data through it and essentially making it so that our loss is as small as possible. So, there's a lot of different factors going on. There's our model itself, which essentially describes how we're gonna transform the input data. Right? You can sort of see that, for example, x right here is a number. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a scalar value. Uh, but in the case of the images, x right here is an image. And a is essentially, a, it, it, we essentially need to get to choose how do we transform x in such a way that it's th that we can compare it and say how good a prediction that is. So we're sort of assuming right here that, <coughs> it's, uh, that it's a line. So this is our model. This is our criteria to decide if our, mo uh, if, if our prediction is any good. And then all we're doing is minimizing. We're just trying, to, we're saying, how do we change these values so that they minimize? And the reason we're changing A and B is because X and Y are sort of set because we, because it, X and Y are sort of the ground truth values which we actually want to try and approximate. That's the map. So now we get to implement this in code. This is this is the next part. Okay. Um, does everyone? Uh, uh, how how does everyone feel about this? Does it? Uh, would you like to be able to? Uh, actually, do you think of it like, do you have an intuitive understanding about it? Uh, is there something that maybe wasn't super clear? Like, maybe this, uh, I don't know, like, what does the gradient actually mean? Uh, that sort of thing. Does anyone have any questions? Why don't we just calculate the minimum directly? Exactly that was my question, but I felt like maybe we will get to it later, but I agree. Okay. How, how would you how would you go around doing Like, 
you're totally right in the sense that, like, <coughs> for example, if we do gradient descent on a line that looks like this, this is our point that we're looking for. If we do gradient descent on this, then a the gradient for a is going to be zero, so it's going to be like no matter like there's no point in changing a. A is pretty good, uh, and it's and like for b it's also going to be zero because it's essentially going to say like for this point like you're good there's no problem, but then for this point right here there's going to be an error so essentially it's going to move the line up a little bit. So the reason we're doing it with one point at the moment is because it's sort of easier to visualize what's going on. Like, imagine instead of A being a number, A is an array of like 100 numbers. This whole whiteboard is just <coughs> chaos full of numbers. It's pretty, pretty tough to like sort of visualize that. But the, the idea of doing it with, an array, with like an array of numbers, where you do multiple at the same time, so essentially you grab This is this, this the same operation. The same thing happens. Like you essentially calculate the gradient for each one of these pairs, like this, and then all you need to do is then simply sum uh, like sum all the gradients together, average them together, and then you've got sort of a direction that suits all the points more or less. It's sort of a compromise. Essentially, you are taking like, okay, out of all of these points, which in this case is three, which one, like, which direction should I take in so that it satisfies most of them, more or less? And so, essentially you do, you, you, do, the, you do the derivative, uh, you calculate the derivative for A and B for each one of these, and like this one will tell you like, A should be moved to like plus 0 0.1, and A should be moved plus, I don't know, 0 0.4. Uh, and essentially here you just find a compromise and say plus 0 0.2. Um, so the overall gradient is the same. You're applying the same operation to A. You're simply doing it for multiple points. And that in effect, that's exactly what a batch is. Here we're, uh, we're doing it for a batch size of one. Is everyone familiar with what a batch is? No? Okay. Batch is simply, instead of grabbing one, one point at a time, one sample, uh, you're simply doing this whole like gradient descent process for maybe 10 samples at a time. And then for those 10 samples, you calculate the gradient for each one of them, and then you average the gradient together. So if for one of these, uh, if for one sample, the gradient is telling you move, move this way, and then for another sample, the gradient's telling you move this way. Then you got to decide like which which way do I go? But these samples are telling me conflicting uh, conflicting places, so directions. So you say, okay, I'm going to move in this direction, and that's what you do. You simply take the average for the gradient for each one of these, and that's that's all the that batch. So that's actually a good question because we actually just deploaded batches. Yes. I don't understand exactly why when you have calculated the partial derivative of f with respect to b, you also took a as minus 1 and not the next value as minus 0 times 2. The reason we're doing that is because we're sort of considering the updates of a and b as happening in parallel. Right. <coughs> exactly. So for example, in theory, in reality, you know what, you sort of come up with a state of your model. a is equal to negative 1, b is equal to negative 1. No, think of two. Uh, and you essentially say, okay, for this snapshot of the model, what, what, are the, which direction do I take for each gradient? Oh, like for each for each, for each what the gradient for each value? And then you know what a is. But then if you if you did them like one after the other, you could you could do that. But then it's sort of like 
conflicting information to them. Maybe imagine a like you, your 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 uh, learning rate is like really high, and a tells you uh, change the the gradient instead of being like this. J tells you change the gradient to this, and then b is gonna it'll, like will move you. Like b will say, okay, you need to move down. Like, just take you over here. It's sort of like there's too many. It was sort of, there's, no, there's too much going on. So essentially, if you just take a, a, a small step with like all the gradients sort of fixed, and then you say, okay, I'm going to update each gradient, each, each, each weight according to what the gradient is telling me, then you're sort of taking a small step towards the actual, towards the, what the minimum is. Yeah. Good question. Is that you get you can still ask the questions uh, afterwards. We're just going to go through the code uh, to see. The, so instead of putting <coughs> all this sort of information up in our heads, we're actually going to implement it in the code. So let's take a look. Wipe my hands. Reconnect. To, um, also works on the phone. This experience isn't very good, but it does work on the phone. <laughs> okay. So the font size is good for everyone, right? Good. Thumbs up? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, so the all that TensorFlow is. Because uh, TensorFlow has been like, uh, like it's sort of like really like you, you hear it a lot of times together with machine learning and everything, uh, KRAS, all these sorts of things. TensorFlow is just a way of doing this gradient operation really fast. So like <coughs> what TensorFlow is doing is essentially saying, okay, here's your function, define the function, I will calculate the gradients for A and B. So all this gnarly math that we've done, TensorFlow gets to do it for us, and it just tells us minus eight at the end. That's all TensorFlow does, that's all any sort of machine learning framework does at the root level. It's just simply saying, how do we change these variables? And TensorFlow has a fairly neat way of doing it, especially in this newer version, which is TensorFlow 2. So the way we execute these cells is by doing shift enter, by the way, for anyone that doesn't know Koda. So here we're just doing some imports. And there's this neat thing with Colab that essentially allows us to check the runtime type. So we're using Python 3, and we're using a hardware accelerator, which is a GPU. Um, GPU does basically loads of operations in parallel, uh, which is great for things like calculating gradients and doing matrix multiplications. So we just set that to GPU, and we can take a look at our GPU right here. So if we run NVIDIA SMI, this is simply telling us this is what our GPU looks like. It's a Tesla K80, as opposed to a GTX 1080 and stuff. Um, it's got a fair bit of memory. It's fairly toasty, and we can just play with it. So the first thing we're going to do is define our data. So these are our data points. So these these points right here, this is what we're defining. So we essentially do, uh, we say like take a range from like one uh, zero to 99 or one to 100. And then we're reshaping it something like this. So if range, this NumPy range, if what it originally gives us is reshape operation is doing is saying increase the dimensions so that we get this. Like this. This is 
this is what x looks like for us. It's basically an array of arrays where every single number is uh, a value for x. And then y is essentially the same thing, only that we're essentially applying what is our ground truth a. So a, it, what the real value of a is going to be is 3. And what the real value of b is going to be is 4. And here we're just applying a little bit of noise right here. So this is just, an, instead of having it like a totally straight line, which would be very easy for a model to like sort of uh, try and fit, we're sort of making it the loss of this. <coughs> that, and that's why, that's why our, line, uh, our points don't look super uniform. So if we execute this, we can plot it. data looks like this. So now x looks like this, y is another version where it's times 3 plus 4, so y is going to be 7, and so on. These are our number pairs. So the next thing is, okay, so this is, so now that we've defined our data, we can play a little bit of we have to play a little bit with how TensorFlow computes gradients, how TensorFlow does all the fancy math that we've been doing around here. And one way of seeing this is essentially by actually computing the gradient for a specific function. So say we have a function y equals x squared. So this is our function, and we're saying x is going to be some value n. This is x. x is equal to 10. This is what our code is saying. And then we're setting some parameters. So remember the learning rate that we, that we talked about before? We're setting that to 0 0.1. So now, essentially, we've got, our, we've got the function that we're describing here. We've got the value, this variable, that is x. And gradient take is essentially TensorFlow's way of saying, I'm going to record all the actions that are taken on this variable. And then I'm going to give you a gradient with respect to all the actions that have, that have happened. So for example, x is going to <coughs> Uh, we're going to pass in x, which is originally 10, and uh, multiply it by itself, set it to y. We're going to calculate the gradient here, and then we can assign, we're going to assign x that new value, and we're going to iterate over this as many, for as many steps as we want. So for example, if we run this, So what's happening is essentially we have x right here, and we're computing the gradients. And we're saying, OK, the gradient is telling us that it's, ne a, it's telling us that it's positive. So in order to decrease this, in order to decrease a, the loss, which is in our case like x squared, we need to move in the opposite direction of the gradient, which, because it's positive, we want to move this way, so we're going to take x minus the gradient. So x equals x minus uh, d, uh, dx, dx. And that's what we do. This, this assign sub is simply the negative operation, so it's the like to with negation. And we're multiplying it by the learning rate. We're getting the gradient. So let's actually print <coughs> this, this gradient. So we do print, print as what happens. Oh, perfect. So these are our gradients. 
So at the start, the gradient for x is relatively, like relatively speaking, large. We can essentially, like we can see how much we're negating from x here. And then at the next step, x is going to be equal to a smaller value. So for example, if I print x afterwards, so print. And that's exactly what this graph tells us right here. We start at 8 and go closer and closer and closer to 0. Uh, can anyone tell me what happens if the learning rate was larger? Like, what happens line to x is going to be uh, 40, right? So x is going to be equal to uh, negative 30, because it's x minus the gradient times the learning rate. So x is, x is new value, which was originally 10, is now going to be negative 30. 